Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big Joe's Journal. Well, after uh, a holiday weekend last weekend, we're back on and uh, we're at the end of January. It's really hard to believe 2020 and here we are at the end of January. Well, this is a uh, history making time in this country. As you know, the impeachment trial of, John, of Donald John Trump is now before the Senate. And chances are, while he was impeached by the House, chances are that uh, he will be found innocent in the Senate. Now, two previous presidents that were impeached, the same thing happened. Andrew Johnson, back in 1868, was impeached by the House. Uh, his impeachment was because he was sort of very, very contrary to the policies of Abraham Lincoln. And I believe he fired the uh, secretary, I believe it was the secretary of war. And the Senate didn't approve of it. And that was one of the articles that they used to impeach him, at least in the House. And the Senate, by one vote, and that was the vote of uh, Senator Ross from Kansas, uh, found him innocent. So he, he was not found guilty. But the fact that he was impeached was still on his record. Andrew Johnson, of course, was from Tennessee. And he was Abraham Lincoln's running mate in 1864. And on the death of Lincoln, of course, he succeeded to the presidency. And his uh, policies were virtually contrary to those of Lincoln and of Congress at the time. He was very, very much in favor of slavery. He didn't like the idea of the Emancipation Proclamation, or did he like the idea of the 13th Amendment, which uh, ended slavery in this country. And uh, Johnson also had a habit of uh, getting into the sauce a little bit too much. But the result was he was impeached by the House, but not convicted by the Senate. The same thing with Bill Clinton. As you know, Bill Clinton was impeached by the House, and uh, uh, he was uh, not convicted in the Senate. Now we have the uh, Nixon resigned before he was impeached, and he would have been found guilty for sure. And now we got an individual there that should be found guilty, but um, the chances are he too will not be convicted. But he will also have that impeachment, the fact that he was impeached on his, on his record, which hopefully will be less than a year. <clears throat> It's rather interesting, <clears throat> excuse me. As you look at the, his defense team, the four lawyers he picked for defense, one is uh, retired Harvard Law professor uh, Gersowitz, who was one of the defense attorneys for O.J. Simpson. And um, he was, a, uh, he was uh, the now deceased uh, Molester Epstein was his attorney. And Gershowitz, even though he admits to having uh, liked to play around with young women, says he didn't molest them because he wore his underwear. Well, I don't know how you would look at that. And one of his co-attorneys, of course, is Robert Starr. Starr was one of the prosecuting attorneys in the uh, Clinton impeachment. Now he's defending the president. Uh, Mr. Starr was the president of Baylor, Baylor University in Waco, Texas. At the time, the uh, football team decided to uh, um, attack and molest the co-eds on campus down there. And it was while Starr was president, he kind of turned his back on it. You know, if he didn't see it, well, it wasn't happening. But the fact that it was, and it was investigated, and Starr was fired, as was the football coach. And a number, most of the football team was booted out of school, and some of them did a little prison time. Well, Mr. Starr saw nothing happening. You know, all right, go ahead, football player wants to molest him, go ahead. So, you got a molester denier, a molester turned the other way, as part of the defense team, defending the molester in chief sits in the White House. And it's very interesting, when you see these videotapes of 
the accused meeting with different uh, shady characters. Two uh, former Russian agents that are now under indictment in our judicial system. And a number of other uh, people that um, aren't exactly totally law-abiding. And Trump denies knowing them. And, and here you have pictures. They are pictured with them. They are having a meal with them and everything else. No, I don't know him. I don't know him. Well, obviously. I mean, that's a lie. That's a lie. And, of course, anybody that's got a brain in their head knows that uh, the guy sitting in the White House is a liar-in-chief. Certainly, the way he put down, or tried to not down, the injuries that our servicemen received in Iraq from that Iranian missile attack, a uh, number of concussions. I think there were 34 that were taken to medical centers in, uh, in, in uh, Germany. A number of them were brought over here to the United States, Walter Reed, to be treated over here. And so what is the, the big fellow that uh, obviously couldn't serve because of those wicked bone spurs on his heels? No, oh, nothing. You know, I got a little headache, a few headaches. Well, let me tell you, friend, you get a concussion from an explosion or anything else, it's, it's a headache and it's in capital letters. It's painful. And of course, you know, for uh, the guy that... Uh, couldn't make it because of bone spurs. Um, well, what difference does it make if it's some 19, 20-year-old kid that's got a brain concussion? What difference does it make to him? It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference. Well, anyway, the, the proceedings are going on. They'll be on your audio major networks this afternoon, and, um, probably into the evening. I believe this is the second of three days that Trump's team will uh, be presenting their side of the question. The battle is on to still have witnesses, and I should think there would be enough Republican senators who uh, would want to stand up and say, yeah, we got to have, have witnesses. Bring in John Boynton, John Bolden. Bring in Mitch Mulaney and some of these people that were in on the know. And let's hear what they've got to say. But unfortunately, the majority of, of Republican senators don't have any backbone. They don't have any guts. And they're afraid of the commander in chief. I think there are some that might possibly stand up and say, hey, wait a minute now. We've got to have some witnesses. I think it's Susan Collins from Maine. Mitt Romney from Utah, um, possibly the uh, senator from Alaska, maybe one or two others. They get a majority vote, 51 senators say, yeah, we want to hear from witnesses. They need 67 to convict. And are they going to get that many Republicans to slide over? I don't think so. I don't think that many have that much courage. You can see how the country has hit rock bottom. With what we have in the White House, the leadership in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, he's as rotten as Trump. And I saw something the other day on TV that, that really, really disgusted me. You know, uh, I, I'm pretty much pro-life, and I've contributed financially to the pro-life movement in Vermont. When I saw Trump talking at the pro-life rally. I was absolutely disgusted. What he's trying to do is get their votes. But Donald Trump is no more pro-life than Adolf Hitler was pro-Jewish. And that is a fact. He is no more pro-life than Adolf Hitler was pro-Jewish. It's just a ploy to get more conservative votes. A really ridiculous picture, I think I saw it, I can't remember, it was Time Magazine or some newspaper, of a group of uh, Southern evangelists praying over Trump. And he's standing there, 
looking like the total idiot that he is, while they're praying over him. You know, he's playing this for all he's worth. The man has no more sense of religion, no more sense of decency. He's such a saintly fellow, why didn't he tell the truth once in a while? Well, I think we've hit rock bottom, folks. I think we've hit rock bottom. And <clears throat> I don't think he'll be convicted. That's pretty obvious. Have to do the job in November. And that's why the Democrats have got to put together a ticket that can do the job in November. And of course, the procedure of picking a candidate begins next week in Iowa. And right now, uh, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden seem to be running neck and neck. Bernie seems to have a little upper hand, and he has a little upper hand in New Hampshire. Well, I don't believe Bernie can win. I don't believe he can, he can win the presidency. I think if we're going to have a change in Washington, the man to do it is Joe Biden, as I've said many, many times, former Vice President Biden. And he's got to pick the right running mate. And as far as I'm concerned, that, running right, that right running mate has to be a woman. And it should be the junior senator from California, Kamala Harris, or the congresswoman from Hawaii, who is still in the running. I'm surprised she is still running, but she's campaigning in New Hampshire. That's uh, uh, Congresswoman Gabbitt from Hawaii. Uh, she is a veteran. She flew helicopters in Iraq, and she also served in Afghanistan uh, flying helicopters. And she and uh, Harris, at least in the Democratic debates, were not the best of buddies. And she certainly is not a friend of Hillary Clinton. In fact, she has filed a suit against Hillary Clinton for a defamation of character, which shows she's, a, uh, she's her own woman. She has the courage to stand up, and it didn't make any difference who she's standing up against, but she's got the courage and the guts to do it. And that's what, we're, that's what we need in our president. We got a guy right now that's a puppet of Putin in Russia. Who's the president of the United States? It's Mr. Putin, who's also the president of Russia. The guy we got in the White House is his puppet. He's our nominal president, but he won't stand up to Putin. He makes a number of dumb decisions. He's supposed to make a deal with a little chop chop there in North Korea. And he got taken to the cleaners on that. He was made to look ridiculous on that. For a guy that can make deals here, there, and everywhere, he hasn't made a decent deal yet. Possibly the new trade agreement between Canada and Mexico that was negotiated by other people, not by him, might be the uh, best deal he has made since he's been in the position he's in. But the process, of course, of uh, picking the 46th president, and we're going to call it the 46, uh, begins next week. And then, of course, from there, it goes to New Hampshire. Incidentally, uh, taping this show on the 27th of January, and former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg is in Burlington today. I was watching the news on Channel 3, and he's meeting at... Um, Oh, the uh, echo thing and down on the, uh, on the lakefront shore. And he didn't have very many people there. <clears throat> of course, it's early. More people might show up. But I think I counted maybe 10 people. And they were having coffee and talking with him. So if he hopes for a big rally, um, maybe more people will show up later on in the afternoon. I don't know. Michael Bloomberg um, got a lot of money and he's financing his own campaign. 
But um, Mr. Yang, who's also a millionaire, Tom Stafford, millionaire, they don't have a chance of being the Democratic nominee. And common sense would tell me, let's come together, let's build a ticket. The bottom line is to get rid of Trump. That's the bottom line. And some people say, well, I can do it. You know, they all say, I can do it, I can do it. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They've got to build a ticket, and they've got to all get behind it. And all these people that are out demonstrating, demonstrations are fine. But in the American system, demonstrators don't amount to a hoot if you don't go to the ballot box and vote. You've got to show up and vote. And that's what happened in 2016. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 3 million votes. So the current president is the minority president, although he won't admit it, but he is. She beat him by 3 million. And this was in spite of the fact that the vast majority of the nation didn't trust her, nor did they trust the one that was elected in the Electoral College. But the fact that as flawed as she was as a candidate and as poor a campaigner as she was, she was still able to beat this guy by three million votes. It shows that if the Democrats come up with a strong, reasonable ticket, they're going to win this thing in a landslide. The next big thing is that the member of African-American voters who sat on their hands because they didn't buy into Hillary, and I can't blame them for that. The number of blue-collar workers who believe Trump's lies, and I'll see it for that. The number of farmers, some of them are still on the fence, but Trump's policies have not helped them. Hopefully they'll smarten up, make the right decision. All these people come together, the Hispanic people. If you think he's going to be your man, look at what he's done to your fellow Hispanics on the Mexican border. Look at the concentration camps we have down there. Look at the policy of taking children away from their parents and then sending their parents down to, down to Guatemala, back to Guatemala. And that's not a policy of American democracy. That's a policy of Nazi Germany. Today is the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz by Soviet troops in World War II. And many, many former people that were incarcerated there by the Nazi government have gone back for the celebration. Well, hopefully at the end of World War II, we figured the idea of concentration camps would be over. The idea of taking children away from their parents would be over. But it's happening again under this administration. The number of kids that are taken away from their parents and put in separate camps Many of them were shipped to a camp in Florida where they were not taken care of, in some cases abused. Well, when the press caught up with it, the Trump administration shut that down and said, get them back into Texas. Policy now, you take the children away from the parents, what do they do with the parents? Ship them down to Guatemala. Mexican parents, if you don't want them here, send them back to Mexico, maybe. Give them a chance to get back to their kids. But don't send them to Guatemala. Guatemala is the most, one of the most unsafe countries in the world. You got a bunch of killer gangs, drug cartels down there. You know, it just, it's so un-American. In our Declaration of Independence, the second paragraph of our Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson, who himself was a slaveholder, he wrote that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with the inalienable right to life, to liberty, and to the pursuit of happiness. In our Constitution, we talk about we the people to form a more perfect union. That's the way our Constitution starts off. 
And we have the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ask yourselves how we're living up to those ideals today. We aren't. We're backing away from them. And what we have, and if we continue on our present trend, and we don't change that come this November, we're headed in a direction where the Constitution, which is the law of the land, and is being challenged right now, the Constitution is going to take an awful hit. We, the people, have the opportunity to make a change. We have the opportunity to turn this country around and to bring it back to make it what it should be. We have a country which has a glorious history, but also a shameful history. The years of slavery was a shameful period in American history. It only terminated, as such, with the Civil War, which had more American casualties than any of our other, any of our other conflicts. It took the 13th Amendment to end slavery in this country. It had the 15th Amendment, which gave the right to vote to every person. In other words, you couldn't deny the right to vote because of the pigment of their skin. Unfortunately, when that amendment was passed, only men could vote. And uh, many of the uh, women suffragettes who were campaigning for equal rights for women would not support the 15th Amendment. But they said, we still can't vote. And it's rather interesting as we come to the election of 2020, that it was 100 years ago that women finally got the right to vote and the right to hold property and the right to be considered as human beings in this country. The 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. And that was passed by, by Congress. And it came during the administration of Woodrow Wilson who, even though he was a Democrat, was a very strong racist. But we'll talk about that a little later when uh, I'm finishing up my series on the presidents. But 1920 was the first time women had the right to vote. And it's rather interesting that prior to that, <clears throat> Montana had had a female governor, although she didn't have the right to vote. But the male voters in Montana elected her governor. This is back around 1914, 1916. So 1920, for the first time, women could vote for a president. And who did they vote for? Well, they voted for Warren Gremlin Harding, senator from Ohio. Senator Harding had a, a very, very strong reputation as a womanizer. His wife, First Lady, after the inauguration, she went home to Ohio. Because it was said that uh, President Harding had a uh, lady friend stashed away in every closet in the White House. Well, Harding's running mate was Calvin Coolidge. And of course, when Harding died by mysterious circumstances. Most people say he committed suicide, which I imagine he probably did because of the corruption in his administration. His attorney general had uh, been forced to resign, was convicted, and was doing time in the federal pen, along with a couple of other cabinet officers, and it was starting to catch up to him. So he probably did commit suicide to keep from going to jail. And Calvin Coolidge, silent Cal, Cal saw a lot, but he said nothing. Became our, 
our uh, president. And of course, Calvin Coolidge here in Vermont is reverenced almost. But it was many of the policies of the uh, Coolidge administration that set up the Great Depression of 1929. Well, we are at a uh, very pivotal point in our history. As I said earlier, we have some shameful aspects. One of them was the number of years it took for women to be able to vote. And it's just a very, very short time before we'll have our first female president, probably 2020, 2024. I wouldn't be surprised for female president at that time. We look at some of the other factors, uh, the way we treated the Native Americans ever since the Europeans landed here. Not only imported diseases from Europe that killed off many, many of our Native Americans, but the fact that we took their land from them. Andrew Jackson, who signed the Indian Removal Act, which resulted in the great Cherokee tribes of North South Carolina and Georgia, Tennessee, being rounded up by military troops and uh, forced to move across the Mississippi River into what was then virgin territory, the state of Oklahoma, the great, great Cherokee nations, the famous, or infamous, if I should say, Trail of Tears, and of course, the number of massacres that took place where uh, Indian villages were raided by military militias, and women and children killed. Shameful part of our history, but we've also had many, many glorious aspects. And right now we're at another pivotal time. Do I think uh, Trump will be convicted? The truthful answer is no. No. I think the effort has been made. The evidence has been laid on the table. I think if you're going to have a trial, you've got to have witnesses, and hopefully enough Republicans will, will cross the aisle. You only need four of them to get that uh, 51 senators voting to require the Senate to subpoena witnesses. And you're going to get the whole story, the true story. Let's get the whole thing. We know that Trump is guilty, whether he's acquitted by the Senate or not. We know he is guilty. We know his, uh, well, I don't know what to call him, but the former New York Mayor Giuliani, I think he's a nut myself, but he's as big a gangster as Trump. And they both belong sitting in a federal prison cell which I think where Donald Trump is going to wind up. He's going to be our first president, probably die in prison. If I were him, I wouldn't worry so much about whether I'm found guilty in the Senate or not. I'd worry about what happens when a federal judge gets to look at my income taxes. You know, many of our large gangsters from back in the 20s and 30s what the federal government got them on was income tax evasion. Not for the crimes and the murders and everything else they committed, but they went to jail because of income tax evasion. And Trump doesn't want anybody seeing his income taxes. Again, it's a major case of income tax evasion. And for him, the importance of being reelected in November is for four more years, it'll keep him out of jail. And what does he do after that? Well, chances are, if he's reelected, he could be impeached again. And if the Democrats are controlling the Senate, this time he will be convicted. Well, you know, we're at, we're at a, as I've said before, we're at a crucial time in our history. And we have hit, as far as Morale, as far as decency in government, as far as fair play in government, I don't know. We can only go up, and let's hope that happens and happens soon. So with that, may Almighty God and his infinite wisdom, especially in this time of trouble, bless this nation. And may you all have a great week.
and we'll see you all next week.